Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Asma Shindi, petroleum engineer who recently graduated from American University of Ras al-Khaimah. On behalf of Biopetro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, and SPE Egypt section, I would like to say welcome back and Happy New Year. And as usual, I would like to welcome all of you to the first lecture of our short course, Field Development Geomechanics, present presented by a very expert speaker, Engineer Hamid Soroush. As planned, our course is four webinars, four quizzes, and a final exam. Certificates are provided if you have scored higher than 70% of the total grade. Before I present our speaker, I would like to remind you, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and keep the chat box professional. Now our speaker is, doc is Dr. Hamid Soroush. He is an internationally recognized geomechanics expert with more than 25 years of experience in geomechanics applications. He has conducted or managed more than 250 consulting and research projects worldwide. Dr. Hamid is currently the CEO of PetroLearn LLC with the objective to apply learning from oil and gas to accelerate movement toward clean energy. Dr. Hamid holds Bachelor in Mining Engineering, a Master's in Rock Mechanics and PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Curtin University in Australia. He has been selected as SPE Distinguished Lecturer in 2012, 2017 and 2020. Today, this session will be a theoretical background. So please pay attention and welcome engineer, uh, Dr. Hamid Soroush. Dr. Hamid, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Asma, for the introduction. And uh, a big thank, thank to uh, Pio Petro for, uh, for the great you know, intention uh, to, to help the students around the world to, to learn more about uh, petroleum engineering and other subsurface uh, basically uh, engineering disciplines. So it's a pleasure for me to, to be in this session today. Uh, I think we're we gonna have uh, four sessions on geomechanics and I try to actually give you a, a, a sound, you know, foundation and, and uh, fundamental uh, learning of, of, of uh, geomechanics uh, with applications to uh, mainly oil and gas industry. Uh, so, uh, as you see that uh, the title is Field Development Geomechanics, uh, uh, I would like to start with, the, I mean, the Asma did a great job, but uh, this slide basically shows my contact information and uh, uh, my personal information in case uh, uh, you have questions after the class. Uh, I suggest I, I'm more typically more interactive on LinkedIn rather than answering emails. I think I have about 500 emails uh, waiting for answer. So if, if you have any questions or uh, uh, concern, just just I mean follow me on LinkedIn and, and send your questions to uh, to my LinkedIn. So uh, again, this is introduction. I just uh, go over it. Oops. Let me, oh, or, okay, I don't want to spend really time on. Uh, one thing that I, want, uh, I would like to bring up in this session before I start the course, uh, I'm actually giving a, a SP Distinguished Lecturer uh, starting uh, started last year and continuing this year. I think the next uh, presentation is, is uh, next week for uh, Utah and Alaska uh, SP section, but I believe it's open to everybody who wants to attend because it's virtual. So uh, the topic of this talk is uh, seven scenes of the classic wellbore stability models. And uh, I, I discuss, you know, the, the seven big mistakes that uh, even geomechanics people in our industry typically uh, make uh, when they are trying to help drillers to have a safer drilling. Uh, we, we call this application wellbore stability. So if you are interested, just, just uh, look at the uh, SPA website, uh, Distinguished Lecturer uh, page, and then you will find the information about registration. Uh, okay, just uh, to give you a quick uh, overview of the uh, four sessions that we will have. Uh, today, session one, uh, I will focus more uh, on the introduction. What is geomechanics? What is the importance of it? Uh, and uh, uh, then we basically uh, spend most of the, the session on uh, theories, uh, fundamentals of uh, stresses, deformation, and failure of, of rock, uh, which is requirement uh, 
for basically learning uh, any other ses sessions, sections. But uh, these are, I, I try to actually summarize this uh, theory section to what you really need to understand uh, before we, we go forward in, uh, in this course. So uh, the second session, which is next week, uh, I will walk you through the workflow of developing uh, a geomechanical model for a oil field or for a well, uh, we have 1D, we have two, uh, 3D and 4D geomechanical models, depends on the application. So uh, we will tell you, I mean, uh, what, what are the basically steps that you have to take and what type of data you need, what methodologies we have to basically uh, estimate or calculate uh, geomechanical model uh, component, which are basically rock properties, pore pressure prediction, and in situ stresses. So this uh, topic will continue to session three as well, uh, with more focus on the stress estimation. And then the last uh, session I will, uh, sorry, session four, uh, I will walk you through the, uh, some of the main applications, uh, including wellbore stability, hydraulic fracturing, and reservoir geomechanics. Okay, so uh, with that said, uh, typically I, I start my courses with a, a few questions to, to magnify the importance of geomechanics. Uh, you know, before we touch any uh, oil and gas field, there are some questions that we need to be able to answer, uh, or we, we, we at least we, we want the answer to those questions. So imagine we, we drill a well uh, in a field, and uh, this is a vertical well, right? Uh, but the drilling is a smooth, nothing happens during the drilling, everything looks good. Now we want to drill another well, let's say like one kilometer apart. So the fact that the first well was safe, does it mean that the second uh, well is gonna be successful as well? And the answer to this question is that we, we don't know. I mean, uh, it all depends on the, you know, uh, geomechanical parameters variation along the field. Uh, why we should go like one kilometer apart. Imagine we have a vertical well drilled successfully and, uh, and now we want to make a deviated section into it, right? We want to basically kick off a deviated well or maybe do a horizontal. It's the same location, just slightly different, you know, uh, uh, wellboard trajectory. Is it gonna be successful? The answer is the same, we, we don't know and uh, there are many questions like this. For example, uh, questions like which, which mud weight do, should we use to have a safe drilling? Uh, where should we put our casings to have the wider, widest you know, mud weight window and the safest basically uh, uh, drilling status? What is the safest well trajectory? Uh, is it horizontal? Is it vertical? Is it deviated? Which uh, azimuth, which you know, deviation? Uh, what's the effect of natural fractures uh, and bedding planes on, on wellbore stability? Uh, you know, underbalanced drilling, I don't know how much you are familiar with this concept, it is very attractive uh, for drillers, for operators, uh, but is it really feasible to do that? Underbalanced drilling is when you drill with a mud uh, pressure lower than pore pressure. So it's, 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 in typical drilling, it's really risky to do that. But we have advanced technology called UBD that uh, basically enables uh, doing that. Uh, now, we talk about which trajectory is safest for drilling, but which trajectory is, is uh, best for our production to get the maximum production out of a reservoir, either conventional or unconventional. Uh, is horizontal well a good idea? You know, speci specifically in unconventional, everybody are drilling horizontal wells, but is it really the best option for uh, best production? <clears throat> what would be the direction and extension of hydraulic fractures when we do fracking? Uh, do we really know where the fracture will go? Do, do we know really they, they contribute into the uh, production? Uh, should we do props? Fracking or acid fracturing is a big question uh, in uh, some of the fields like carbonate fields in uh, Middle East, for example. Uh, you know, sand production is one of the challenges uh, uh, in producing from sandstone reservoirs. Uh, uh, we should know if, if we get this problem during production or not, or, or if we get in which stage of the production, how we can solve this, how we can manage this. 
And the last question, what would be the effect of production on reservoir compaction in, a, in the longer term, right? And, and even on the surface, because when you, uh, oil and gas, uh, basically reservoir get depleted and compacted, so you, typically we see the effect on the surface as subsidence, which is a big, huge risk uh, to residential areas if there's anything close by or if you are offshore to your platform because your platform starts subsiding. So the answer to all these questions is <clears throat> actually can be provided by uh, Mr. Geomechanics, right? So what is geomechanics? Uh, I would like to start with some definition, uh, starting from definition of rock mechanics. Uh, rock mechanics is basically uh, the theoretical and applied science of predicting or modeling mechanical behavior of rocks under a stress or force field. So basically we have uh, a media of rock, right? It has different rocks in it, different layers, lithologies. It is under uh, a stress field, right? There are stresses acting, which include you no know, uh, tectonic stresses, overburden, uh, basically weight of the uh, layers above the, the basically layer we are looking at. Uh, there are forces, there are uh, fluid pressure uh, applying to that uh, basically piece of rock. Rock mechanics science basically provide methodologies, you know, uh, that you can predict or model the behavior or the reaction of this rock to this stress or force field. And when you change these forces and stresses, like with human activities, like drilling production, geomechanics can, I mean, rock mechanics can, can basically, uh, uh, again, um, show you how the rock will, will react to these basically changes. Uh, rock mechanics is basically concerned with the application of principles of engineering mechanics. Uh, so it's a very important point here because there's a misconcept in the, in the oil and gas industry that geomechanics is a discipline under geology. I want to make it clear here that geomechanics, uh, rock mechanics and geomechanics both are engineering disciplines. They involve a lot of math, mechanics, physics, and if, if you don't understand math behind it, if you don't understand uh, material science, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, you, you, can, you should not really touch this discipline, right? It's very engineering, is is to design, uh, it's, it's like your civil engineering, like mechanical engineering, you design a, a structure, but a structure which is uh, either in, uh, inside the rock or on the rock, right? On the rock, for example, you, you're, you're building a dam, right? It's a heavy uh, structure or a sky is uh, basically a tower. So the foundation typically goes on the rock and then rock mechanics is required to, to design the, the foundation and the structure. Tunnels, you know, mining shafts, uh, this underground uh, ground excavation, these are the subsurface basically structures. Again, they need engineering design and rock mechanics is the tool to basically do this. And oil and gas wells are part of the subsurface structures, right? Uh, that requires uh, design and modeling using rock mechanics. Uh, yeah, when you, you do like in civil engineering, you, you, you do you know, road cuts like, or trenches, uh, waste you know, uh, disposal. Again, you need uh, knowledge of rock mechanics. So now what, what's geomechanics? Uh, you know, geomechanics uh, definition-wise is, is a wider or uh, uh, more a broader, basically, subject that covers soil as well or any any uh, geomaterial. I don't know except rock and soil what we, we might have actually on, on uh, subsurface. But uh, geomechanics is basically rock mechanics plus soil mechanics. But when we are in the oil and gas industry and we we mentioned geomechanics because we are not dealing with soil. We're basically talking about rock mechanics. So it's, it's kind of misconcept. So uh, just remember when we talk about geomechanics in oil and gas is, is equivalent to rock mechanics, but by definition, rock mechanics is, is part of geomechanics. So uh, this is very important actually to understand this because there are many people in our industry, even in the geomechanics community, they, they cannot recognize between rock mechanics and geomechanics. Some people say uh, rock mechanics is just in the lab. When we take the 
uh, you know, core and tested. This, this is rock mechanics. No, it's not. Rock mechanics is is basically involved with field work as well. Like if you go to mining, civil engineering uh, communities, uh, they always talk rock mechanics, right? In oil and gas, as I said, I mean, geomechanics is more pronounced, right? So for example, if you search for rock mechanics to find a job in oil and gas industry, probably you, 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 you find a few opportunities like Chevron, for example, use rock mechanics. Uh, uh, but majority of the companies use, use geomechanics. It's, it's opposite in mining industry. Okay, so hope it was clear so far. So as I said, uh, uh, rock mechanics or geomechanics have application in mining industry, like you know tunnels, uh, uh, shafts, in civil engineering, like road trenches, and uh, of course oil and gas or dam design, uh, and oil and gas industry, which is the topic of our uh, basically discourse. Now, let's specifically talk about uh, petroleum geomechanics or petroleum related rock mechanics. So, you, you might know actually the first book that uh, was published on application of uh, geomechanics in oil and gas industry is called Petroleum Related Rock Mechanics by Erling Fjair. So, it's, it's still a, the best reference actually for you guys if you want to go and learn more about this topic. <clears throat> so, those people, because they're proper, you know, uh, engineers and rock mechanics, they, this is why they, they're sticking to the term rock mechanics because more accurate than geomechanics. So uh, now let's redefine the petroleum geomechanics. Uh, remember rock mechanics was uh, looking at uh, uh, reaction of you know, uh, rocks and the mechanical reaction of the rocks to the stress field. Petroleum geomechanics is a discipline that basically integrates uh, rock mechanical behavior of rock uh, with geophysical information, geophysical information and geological information to quantify the response of earth, which is a big rock, right? Uh, to changes in uh, stresses, right? Reservoir pressure for, and temperature, right? So if in our operations, basically, we change any of these uh, parameters you see here, the rocks will react to them, and we should be able to predict that. We should be able to model that without we drill a well, without we produce from a well, uh, uh, a reservoir, without we do hydraulic fracturing. If we don't have this knowledge, it's like a blind walking on the street without, without uh, any stick or any, any tools that guide him. Right? How, you know how risky it is? So it's exactly the same if we you know, uh, develop a, a field and do operations without having geomechanics. So uh, now, what is the role of geomechanics? Uh, basically, geomechanics do three major things or has three major uh, benefits, uh, which I think is target of any of us working in oil and gas industry or, or other industries. Uh, we all would like to avoid any non-productive time, time that is wasted. You typically we call it NPT, right? Non-productive time. We, we don't have waste, we don't want to waste our time, right? We want to have efficient time. We want to be uh, doing useful things all the time, right? And this is very important uh, for petroleum engineering because our operations are expensive, right? Like one hour, uh, delay in drilling is equivalent to fifty, sixty thousand dollars, right? So we have to be really careful to reduce this uh, the, the non-productive time. We want, we all want to to pay less, right? Nobody wants to pay extra, right? Uh, so de deducting the cost is an objective for everybody in any disciplines, and and geomechanics can really help with that. And risk, which is even more important than these two needs to be reduced, right? Uh, we, don't, we don't want to lose our people and the rigs, you know, we don't want to lose our equipments. We don't want to, uh, you know, uh, have negative impact on the environment. We don't want to uh, pollute the, the, the seawater. We don't want to pollute, you know, the, the land. So these three are basically benefits. Uh, I mean, many disciplines in, in oil and gas industry can actually help with this, but geomechanics has huge contribution to basically these three uh, objectives. So how geomechanics can do that? During exploration, uh, 
Uh, geomechanics reduces exploration risk by uh, an analysis called fault leakage analysis by pore pressure prediction. Basically, uh, if we don't know the integrity uh, of the, the cap rock, uh, which basically contains the reservoir safe, with any operations, we might actually uh, damage that, that containment or integrity of the cap rock or the fault that is basically uh, sealed and keeping the reservoir there. We might, we might actually uh, break the, the cap rock, the seal, and lose the reservoir, right? That there's a huge risk to the environment. Uh, basically, we, lo we lose the objective of our operation. So we really want to avoid that, right? During drilling, uh, geomechanics provides a more accurate, safe over operating uh, mud weight window, uh, which uh, consequence, uh, consequently <clears throat> reduces uh, kicks and loss circulation events. These are all costly events during drilling. Uh, it improves wellbore stability condition, basically reduces the number of problems like a stock pipe, no side tracking, uh, washing and rimming operations, which are all time consuming and expensive. If you are, I mean, you, you want to basically work in the drilling uh, industry, uh, uh, you will see how, how challenging and how uh, uh, you know difficult is dealing with any of these problems it, it takes uh, several hours or even days to basically uh, recover that, uh, or combat with this type of problem uh, geomechanics also helps revealing the feasibility uh, for underbalanced drilling uh, which has many benefits to the uh, to the uh, drilling and, and reservoir basically uh, operations, uh, but again, uh, there are restrictions to, to do under balances. It's risky if you don't know the formation and the stresses. <clears throat> and during production, it improves production from natural fractures, uh, predicts and manages sand production, uh, optimizes hydraulic fracturing operations, and reduces, you know, uh, casing shear and collapse problems, which uh, uh, basically all of these are. Uh, big objective for geomechanics, right? And they're costly, they are time consuming if any of these uh, challenges basically happen. So how much geomechanics can save for us? Uh, there are several statistics out there that shows uh, different companies basically published uh, uh, the costs related to geomechanics or wellbore stability for their operations. Uh, unfortunately, these statistics are, are quite old uh, I was, I'm, I'm struggling to find new uh, numbers because most companies don't really uh, release this type of information anymore. Uh, or maybe geomechanics already solve all these problems, I, I don't know. But uh, uh, the best study actually was done uh, to kind of quantify the cost of uh, geomechanical related problem or any type of drilling problem. Uh, part of it is, is geomechanics related, was done by Dodson and Dodson back in 2004. <clears throat> uh, what they did, they looked at all the publicly available data in the Gulf of Mexico, all the wells that have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico only. And they looked at the non-productive time and the reason behind them. And they list actually, I don't know, 15 different uh, reasons behind the non-productive time. And as you can see, many of these uh, basically reasons are, are geomechanics related, right? So, uh, or wellbore stability related. So according to their paper, 41% of non-productive time during drilling these wells in Gulf of Mexico was due to wellbore stability uh, issues, right? It's geomechanics. And the average cost of these problems was 8 billion American dollar per year. Right, it's a huge amount of basically capital loss uh, because we got stock pipe, we got kicks, we got loss circulation, we, we had shale that uh, was a sloughing, uh, we had uh, you know uh, formation collapsing and creating extra caving and cuttings. All this problem basically delays drilling and this is the average cost. And I still believe that uh, we can rely on this number for two days uh, basically ward. Uh, we are still using this amount of money uh, on a yearly basis, uh, just in the Gulf of Mexico, because we don't properly use geomechanics. <clears throat> so just to quickly review different applications of geomechanics, uh, uh, 
starting from uh, exploration part or uh, for development over uh, finding over pressure zones or doing poor pressure prediction is, is one of the contribution of geomechanics uh, the, uh, providing you know <clears throat> well bore stability model for for drilling a well either vertical or deviated or horizontal uh, is another application uh, uh, designing the well or well well construction uh, where to put the casing uh, how to optimize the size of the well uh, loss circulation uh, uh, prevention, uh, going to the reservoir, and uh, now uh, we want to produce, we might get, uh, you know, sanding, uh, the reservoir get compacted, needs to be actually predicted and modeled. Uh, we have fractured reservoir, we should see how fractures basically react to the changes in the stress field. Uh, when we do hydraulic fracturing, right, uh, geomechanics come to the picture, and then, uh, even going back to the surface after the reservoir is compacted, we will have subsidence on the surface that needs to be actually addressed. And as we see, it, I mean, uh, applications of geomechanics is from uh, well scale all the way to the to the field scale, and from exploration phase to appraisal and all the way to the development and even abandonment. So it means that if, even if you abandon a well bore, uh, a, a field, right, SS geomechanics play a role because we need to monitor the subsurface and, and try to minimize the uh, basically negative impact of uh, subsurface. What is a geomechanical model? On this slide, actually, I quickly show you uh, uh, what are the components of uh, a geomechanical model. But in the next two sessions, I, I, I would walk you through a step-by-step -step, uh, basically process to, to, to estimate or calculate these, these parameters. So basically, geomechanics, uh, a geomechanical model uh, consists of uh, six um, core components. Uh, oh, sorry for the noise. Okay, so uh, uh, these components, uh, we have basically include three uh, principal stress components that are typically vertical stress, maximum horizontal stress, and minimum horizontal stress. These stresses <coughs> have an orientation, we call it a stress direction, or uh, we typically show it with the maximum horizontal stress azimuth. <coughs> And uh, th then the, uh, the fifth one is this pore pressure, the pressure inside the rock, inside the uh, basically pore space in the rock. And the last one is the rock mechanical properties. So basically these stresses are acting on a, on a rock which has properties. So the reaction of the rock is basically defined by this rock property. Uh, having this uh, basically six components, we will have uh, either in, uh, I mean, we have, we'll have a model, a piece of rock with all this information. Uh, now we can drill into this model and see what happens, uh, how the rocks react to the, to the drilling a well. We can do hydraulic fracturing and see what, what's the reaction of the formation. We can produce from a reservoir and see the reaction of the formation, changes in the stresses, changes in the rock properties. Uh, so yeah, having such a model is requirement for any subsurface operations, small or big. In addition to the, these core components, we have a structural geology, we have formations, right? We have false fractures that go to the, th these are input to the model. They are not core components, but uh, basically they are required to, to have a, an accurate model. And the more information we have about these uh, features and isotropy and you know, uh, heterogeneity, the model would be more accurate and uh, reliable. So the purpose of geomechanical modeling is basically estimating these uh, six core components. Okay, now. Let's move to the theories. Uh, the way I, I present this section, I will start uh, first about theory of stress, All right? What's, what's the stress field? What parameters of stress we need to know? Then uh, I talk about theory of deformation. Now, how rocks deform and what parameters of uh, rock we need to know to, to predict this deformation. And the last section would be theory of failure. 
So under a specific stress field, does the rock fail or is just deform, right? That's very important for us to know uh, in different subsurface applications. So let's, uh, let's start from the stresses. So as all of you know, stress definition is basically force acting to a surface area, right? So the force divided by the area is stress. So is, is <clears throat> uh, the units that typically we use for uh, stress is the same as pressure, is PSI or Pascal or bar or anything else that you might use in your region. Uh, but uh, basically uh, this equation uh, normalized the, the, the act of a f the, the uh, magnitude of a force to a unit of uh, surface area, right? So it's kind of normalization. Now, if the force is acting perpendicular to the surface area, that stress is called normal stress, okay? But if it's acting parallel to the surface, right, like what you see here, the stress calculated is shear stress. So there's, there's a difference between normal and shear stresses. And we use these two terms in geomechanics a lot and material science in general. So please try to remember these two basically major uh, stress terms. So now going from a surface to a 3D body like inside the material or inside the rock, right? Now we have different surfaces. There's not just one surface, right? Typically, the way we look at the stresses in a, uh, basically 3D bodies, we pick up an element of the rock, which is uh, uh, a cube, right? And this cube has six surfaces, right? And at, on each surfaces, basically in 3D, we have one normal stress component and two shear components, which are acting perpendicular to each other. Right. Okay. So if we want to specify the state of stress at this point, this is one point in a 3D body, right? We need how many components? Three components at each phase and then multiply by six, 18. Okay. But the good news is that because this point at the body of a rock specifically or material is, is a static. We are talking about a static environment, right? It means this point is not moving. What does it mean? It means that the stresses on two opposite faces are equal. At this face with the face at the back, up, upper face with the lower face, the, the stresses are equivalent. Otherwise this, this cube will start moving around, okay? So this reduces the components of a stress, basically a state to only nine, half of that, right? And then mathematically, the way we present this is a tensor. So as because stress is not actually a scalar, like, like pressure, like pore pressure, is not a vector, like force, is a scalar, right? And a scalar, it means, uh, it has it has magnitude. It has several orientations, right? So tensor of stress is what you see here. So typically we have the normal stresses on the trace of the matrix, and then we have the shear components on the two side of it, right? And uh, in the world of you know, material science, geomechanics, uh, typically uh, we do, uh, we show normal stresses with sigma. Right, and this uh, basic notation shows the orientation of the axis parallel to that. And the shear stress is shown by tau, right? Like what you see here. Okay, now, <clears throat> another good news is that in a static material, this cube not only does not move, but it does not rotate as well, right? What it means, it means that the, the shear components acting against each other should be equivalent as well, right? So this is why this piece doesn't rotate. So with this, basically, we reduce the number of the, uh, basically, components of the tensor to six. 
So here is the conclusion. In a general static stress condition, we can characterize the stress field by calculating or measuring six independent you know, stress components, three normal components and three shear components. It's very general, right? In a general case, it's the most complex case for uh, basically stress uh, deter uh, determination. So just to uh, make sure you don't, don't get confused, uh, in many actually uh, textbooks and papers in oil and gas industry, people, uh, industry people use S for stress instead of sigma. So it's basically the same thing, don't, don't get confused. So we can, we can call, call it SY or sigma Y. So now imagine we rotate this cube, right? I think you are all agreed, although we are at the same point and the basically overall amount of stress acting on this point is equivalent because we are changing the orientation of the surfaces, all those components basically change. The shear components on each face and the normal stress changes, right? So, but having stress tensor for one orientation in one point, we can basically do the transform do the, do the you know, uh, tensor transform and calculate basically new tensor of stress as, at any orientation around that point, okay? But <clears throat> what is important here and I would like, to, and this is important for people, for example, if you have the stress condition close to a fault, right? But you want to actually calculate the uh, normal and shear components right on the surface of the fault, you have to do this rotation. You have to do this, this tensor transform, right? <clears throat> but if you keep rotating this, this uh, cube, right? And you see changes in the uh, stresses, there is only one orientation where all the shear components will be zero and only normal stresses are acting on the cube, right? This stress condition is called principal stress condition. So th this is the most simple actually case of uh, stress to, to, to determine, to characterize. Uh, but how do we know that we are in the basically the principal stress condition or not? And typically, the closer we are to free surfaces, like at the surface, everything is in principal stress condition. There's no uh, shear basically resistant between, uh, let's say, air and, and surface of the, uh, of the earth, right? When you drill a well, on the wellbore wall is a free surface, right? So uh, as we go further away from free surfaces, then there's more possibility that we are not in the principal stress condition again. One of our role in geomechanics is to basically identify that and make sure that uh, we know if we are in this uh, principal stress condition and need only to calculate these three stresses or not. So this is the stress tensor for principal stress condition, right? So sigma one is typically the, the largest stress, the intermediate stress is sigma two, and then sigma three is the uh, smallest principal stress. Okay, so then we have a generic stress tens uh, tensor and we have principal stress. Tensor. So, and before I move to the next slide, uh, when we talk about the vertical and horizontal stresses, typically in the oil and gas industry, are they principal or not? The quick answer is 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 not. They are not because uh, you know uh, if 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 you are operating in basically in a very flat area the surface there's no topography there's no hills there's no mountain uh, starting from uh, surface and going deeper and deeper you are in the principal stress condition but if if you are in uh, operating in a, a mountainous area or close to shore where we have the the continental shore uh, so any basically the job uh, irregularities on the surface it basically takes you to a non-principal stress condition. In this case, a sigma y is not is vertical, but is not principal. So it means you have to calculate the shear components of it as well. Okay, but the deeper and deeper we go, 
the effect of surface topography decreases and we get closer and closer to the principal stress condition. Typically in the uh, depth that we operate in oil and gas industry, which is uh, more than two kilometers below the surface, is very likely that we are always uh, in principal stress condition, except we are close to a salt body, we are close to a major fault. These features basically uh, change the orientation of <coughs> principal stresses, excuse me. Okay. And then uh, the next uh, basically uh, definition that I want to uh, teach here is a principal, basically effective uh, stresses versus the total stresses. What we talk about so far, they're all total stresses. There are stresses that acting on a material regardless of what is inside the material, right? Now, if the material is saturated with fluid, either gas or um, you know, oil or water, there is a pressure called pore pressure inside the pore of the, of the rock that basically apply an oppos opposite basically uh, pressure to the stress. So it means that instead of the rock matrix basically bearing the whole stress or force coming from the uh, overburden, part, part of it goes to the fluid. So basically fluid contribute into the, uh, you know, uh, stress bearing of the, of the material, right? So the part of the stress that goes directly to the matrix of the rock is basically the stress minus the, the pressure that is inside the rock inside the post, right? So this is called effective stress. And it, it, we call it effective in the world of rock mechanics because this is the stress that we really use to do our calculations. If how, how the rock deform, how the rock fails, because the portion that fluid is taking is not part of basically uh, the formation of the rock. It doesn't contribute in the formation, but effective stress is the a stress that basically uh, cause the rock to deform or fail. Okay, so effective stress versus total stress. Please remember that is, is, is really important. So according to the Terzaghi, who is a soil mechanicist, uh, the effective stress, and typically we, we, we show it with the prime uh, sign actually at, at the top, right? So sigma n or whatever sigma prime is equivalent to the total stress minus pore pressure. In rock mechanics, because rocks are not plastic material like soil, is not that, uh, you know, uh, the, the transfer of estrus from basically load source to the, to the rock and fluid is not uh, like soil, right? Because we do, rock is solid because it, it, it can absorb uh, part of the stress in, inside their grains and their uh, grain interaction. So it's not that all the pore pressure contribute to the effective stress, but a part of it, like 50%, 60%, 70% of the pore pressure contribute to basically ultimate uh, bearing of the material. So this parameter here is called BO factor, right? And later on, we might get the chance to actually show you how we calculate that. Uh, but effective stress in rock mechanics is total stress minus pore pressure multiplied by BO factor. So now let's move to theory of deformation. Uh, now we apply a stress to a rock like this, right? This is a normal stress acting to a surface and there is no shear component as you see, but the rock deforms, <clears throat> right? So if the initial length of this piece of rock is L and DL is the changes in the basically uh, uh, length of the, the rock, DL divided by L is ca called strain. Right, strain is the, the parameters that we, we we use to show the deformation of the rock. It shows basically how much a rock deforms due to this basically a stress field. Okay, changes in length change uh, or divided by the original length. So it can be actually volume changes in volume divided by the original volume. We call it uh, volume strain. This is called axial strain. We have lateral strain as well, right? So how we basically uh, quantify this? There are two major parameters to basically 
quantify the elastic deformation of rocks. One is Young's modulus. <clears throat> Young's modulus is actually the amount of stress acting on the rock divided by the amount of strain happened due to this basically uh, stress. So as you see, the larger the Young's modulus, it means a rock needs more stress for a given strain. It means rock is stiffer, is, is harder to deform, right? So Young's modulus, some people call it stiffness uh, modulus, right? It shows how stiff is the rock. Poisson's ratio, so going back to that example, we load a rock sample, right? <clears throat> it deformed axially, right? But it also deformed laterally because it expands laterally, right? You can go to the rock mechanics uh, lab and, and test this when, when basically rocks get shrimped axially, laterally they, they expand, right? So the amount of lateral strain divided by the axial strain is called Poisson's ratio. And it shows that how much of the deformation a rock can basically laterally transfer to the next door pieces of rock, right? So the larger the, these parameters is, it, is, it shows that the rock is more deformable, right? The combination of these two parameters actually give us a lot of information about uh, the deformation, elastic deformation of the rock. Now, uh, apart from Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, we have also shear modulus, lame, lame modulus, uh, bulk modulus, and bulk compressibilities. But the good news is that having only two of these parameters, we can calculate the rest. These are all rock physical equations that can relate uh, two of these parameters to, to another one. Or I have actually better uh, table here that shows how we can calculate any of them with the other two, right? So, but then uh, in world of rock mechanics, typically we, we go for Young's modulus Poisson ratio, and then we calculate all other elastic properties that we need. Now, talking a little bit about the rock behavior models or constitutive models, this plot you see here is, is by far the most important uh, plot in, in rock mechanics. It's called stress-strain uh, cross plot, right? And it shows that by increasing the stress, how the rock deform, how strains basically develop, right? The materials that basically shows this behavior you see here, it means uh, by increasing the stress, the strain linearly increases. And then when you remove the, the stress, the strain also go back to zero. These, these materials are called linear elastic, right? Now, we have this linear elastic material and this one, right? And this one is stiffer because for a given strain, right? This one needs less stress than this one, right? So this is a stiff material, this is a soft material. And the slope of this curve is actually Young's modulus. Remember the equation? Some other materials are elastic. It means when you remove the stress, the strain goes back to zero, but they behave non-linearly, right? These are called non-linear elastic material. There are materials that basically when you increase the load, they don't change until you reach a threshold that at this stress level, the material keeps deforming, right? Until they fail, right? Without needing any extra you know, stress, they just keep deforming, deforming until uh, they fail, right? This material uh, type is called perfect plastic material. So when you remove the, this stress, none of the uh, strain will be recovered. The strain will stay in the rock or in the material. And then we have materials that have actually behave uh, uh, a combination of these two uh, different, you know, uh, models. They initially <clears throat> behave elastically until a certain, basically, a stress level, and then they right away they become pure plastic. So this is called linear elastic, perfectly plastic behavior. But which one of these um, models basically uh, describe rocks? And the answer is actually none of them. Rocks behave like this, right? Let, let's have a closer look at, at the uh, rock behavior. 
So it's a, it's a typical generic, you know, uh, stress strain care for a, for a rock material. So when you load the rocks, initially they show a little bit of plastic deformation as because of the, all the micro fractures in the rock that you, you, you close and make the rock stiffer, right? And then as soon as the rock is stiff, those micro fractures are closed, you go to, to elastic uh, behavior. There is a point at which basically you start creating micro fractures again because you are applying too much stress to the rock. And that's, that's called yield point. Yield point is transition from elasticity to plasticity, right? And then after that, so from to, to, up to here, if you remove the stress, you will see that the strain will be recovered, but it doesn't go to zero because uh, we have some plastic deformation here. So this section is, is a combination of elastic and plastic deformation. It means if you remove this stress at this point, all the elastic a strain will be recovered, but the plastic part will stay in the rock, right? And then you reach the ultimate, basically, um, stress that the, the rock can withhold. So the rock break here, we call it peak strength. The strength of the material is at this point. And then if you have a servo control machine, you can continue loading the rock by decreasing the stress. At the end of the day, all the materials, not, basically there's no material that they're strength after failure goes to zero, right? It goes to a residual strength, right? It means all the materials kind of keep a, a residual strength in themselves, right? This is why you see, for example, faults and fractures in the mountains. So they are failed rock, but they're still there. They didn't fall, right? They didn't basically uh, uh, completely detach from the mountain. <clears throat> So this is very important cross plot in, in geomechanics, please uh, remember that. And going to rock failure. Now, we know how, how the stresses are applied to the rock. We know how the rock deform, but uh, now it's important to know if the rock will fail under this stress condition or not. There are three major uh, failure envelopes, uh, sorry, failure mechanisms that basically rocks uh, break in. Uh, the most important one is, is shear failure. Shear basically, uh, hap shear failure happens when two oppositely oriented uh, forces are acting uh, against each other on a surface, right? Like a fracture or fault, or even material, uh, intact material, uh, basically forces will, will create this uh, 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 surface, shear surface, right? So what happens? The rock will, will fail in shear. Now, if these two uh, oppositely oriented are basically pulling apart a piece of rock, right? That rock will fail in tension or tensile failure. Sometimes the amount of stresses acting on the rock from all directions is too high. That doesn't let the shear failure to happen, but <clears throat> they compress the rock. So the rock will, will crash and, and fulfills the, the porous space inside that and gets uh, the volume of the rock gets basically uh, shrinked, right? This is called compression uh, or compaction failure, basically. So this is a good example of a shear failure in the lab. Basically, if we take a core plug uh, loaded in the lab, either with the confining pressure or without, typically we create a shear uh, failure, right? Uh, this is the first mechanism, basically in, in the lab, right? If you take the same core, you basically pull it apart, you will see that, <clears throat> uh, so th this uh, shear basically failure has, typically has a, a, an acute angle to the loading axis. The tensile failure uh, surface is typically perpendicular to the loading axis, right? So you, you, you uh, pull the uh, basically the sample apart and then you create this uh, you know, tensile failure surface here. And then the last case when the rock is under too uh, much compaction, uh, compression, you see that the grains of the rock, they, you crash them, they fill the porous space and basically the porosity of the rock decreases, it gets compacted and, but weaker because now the integrity of the, the, the you know, um, grains and the con uh, context has been crashed, has been, basically removed. Okay, so these are the three major mechanisms. How we can mathematically explain uh, failure of the rock? 
So I would like to take you to a concept called <clears throat> more circles. Uh, more circles are basic, basically a very simple way to to show the uh, status of a stress in the, in a in a material, right? So imagine you take a core sample to the lab, right? You put it under a confining pressure. It basically supports the rock, and then you increase the axial stress, <clears throat> right? Uh, and the rock fails at sigma one, which is the peak strength. If we go to the stress. Uh, strain basic plot. So if you pick up sigma three and sigma one and put them on a cross plot called shear stress versus normal stress, right? Okay. So you can always draw a, a circle by having these two numbers. Basically, if you uh, add up sigma one and sigma three and divide it by two, you will calculate this point, which is the center of the circle. And then sigma one minus sigma two divided by two give you the uh, radius of the circle, right? So you can draw a circle, okay? So how this circle helps us? It's actually, uh, remember the equation that I was, I was showing you for tensor transform and stuff? It makes that really easy. Because uh, for example, uh, you want to calculate the normal and shear components of a surface, a, a arbitrary surface, let, let's say uh, with, with 60 degree um, angle to the sigma one, right? So what you do for calculating 60 degree angle, you can, from sigma one, you can go two times six, uh, 60 degree, which is 120 degree, right? And this point here that you reach at, it gives you the shear and normal component on that surface, right? Yeah, but here in this case, we are looking at the normal and shear component at, at the shear basically failure surface, right? Which is this basically number here. So with more circles, we can calculate the normal and shear components at any basically point uh, surfaces in the rock, including the uh, failure surface, right? Now, if we do this test uh, basically three, four, five, six times, <clears throat> in the lab with different confining pressure, different sigma three. So of course, with increasing sigma three, you will get a higher sigma one because you are strengthening the material. So if you repeat this process, we get several more circles, right? And if we tangent or fit a line to this, uh, a curve to these circles, it gives us what we call it failure envelope. And failure envelope will tell us at any normal stress condition, what would be the maximum shear strength of the material, right? Like we did this three tests in the lab, we know that if uh, basically we, uh, we put uh, a normal stress of this amount to the rock, for example, this amount, the, the shear strength of the material is this. If we apply more shear to it, it will fail, right? Now, it also expands to the future where we didn't test and we tell us, for example, if the uh, normal stress is here, what happens to your, uh, at which shear components basically uh, you, uh, the rock will fail, right? So it's a predictive tool. You, you do testing in, in a certain, you know, at, uh, stress condition and it tells you what happens in, in future, right? So uh, as you see, this uh, envelope is typically curved. As you go uh, in higher stress condition, the, the, the slope of the curve decreases. But for simplicity, we have a simple model co called more coulomb uh, basically uh, failure uh, criterion. And that, that is a linear one, right? It basically, uh, Mr. Coulomb believes that, it, I mean, for the type of stress range we work on, it's actually from civil engineering. That's why linear works for them. Uh, in oil and gas industry, we don't recommend more Coulomb unless uh, you really, I mean, kind of validate that it works, right? Because as you see, uh, when the stress increases, the, the, the level of stress is go going higher, there is a larger difference between the actual failure envelope and the more Coulomb envelope, right? So it's good for the area that we do the test. For example, if we are focused on the reservoir, it means we are focused on a small range of stress, then we can go linear, right? But if you're looking at the surface stresses all the way to the reservoir, a wide range, then it doesn't really make sense to go for 
Mohr coulomb. So this is the equation for Mohr coulomb. It says that the shear uh, stress is equivalent. Sorry, let's uh, reward it. The shear strength of the material is equivalent to a parameter. This is the basically intersect of the of the of the line. It's called cohesion. Your cohesive strength of the material is is the basically a strength of material when there is no uh, uh, normal stress acting on them, right? Plus the normal stress multiplied by tangent of the, the slope of this line, which is called friction angle. Friction angle and cohesion are the two most important strength parameters of the rock. So Young's modulus Poisson ratio were the most important elastic property of the rock. Friction angle and cohesion are the most important strength parameters of the rock, okay? So, I think with that said, uh, I'm, I'm done with this session and I'm uh, ready to take some of your questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. The session was very inform informative and clear. We have collected one question. I hope uh, we can answer this question. Sure. The question is, how can we relate geomechanics and rock mechanics to hydraulic fracturing? Okay, it's actually the, one of the topics that I will discuss in the, in the last session, uh, application of geomechanics to <clears throat> hydraulic fracturing. But overall, just to answer this question and don't leave it for last session, uh, geomechanics, rock mechanics, will tell us if we frag a formation to which direction the fracture will go it helps us to basically uh, get the geometry, estimation of geometry or extension and height of the fracture in a specific rock and a specific stress field, right? We can optimize the downhole pressure to create a fracture with the geometry that we want, right? We don't want too large fractures to basically break into the cap rock or too small that doesn't really contribute into production. So geomechanics can help with that. So basically geomechanics is, a very, is one of the main input to frac design, how we design our frac, frac parameters to get a geometry that is desirable to us. Uh, it also helps us to avoid micro uh, induced seismicity. It helps us to interpret my, uh, micro seismic data and get information about the faults and fractures. There, there are several different basically contribution that geomechanics can have uh, in hydraulic fracturing. We will discuss them actually in the in more details in the last session. <clears throat> actually, we have uh, one more question. Uh, someone sure. is asking which model is recommended in field? Which model? What, what, no. I don't know what they mean what, by which model. I, get, uh, I mean, guess the geomechanics mo uh, model or, or something. It's probably the, the rock behavior model. Uh, uh, okay. I don't know, can, 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 can we just ask uh, to add some details to the question, maybe? Uh, I, you just asked this question and asked uh, okay. if it's like, which model is recommended in the field? <laughs> no, so it's it's, it's too vague question, I don't know which model, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't get the point here. Okay, if, he, if you, the one who asked, if you have this question, you can add more details in next session and we can answer this question. Yeah, because we talk about geomechanical model, but we don't have which type of geomechanical model. We, we haven't talked about it yet. Uh, and okay. we, have, we talk about the behavior model of the rock. So if th that's the case, then I showed that elastoplastic basically is the best, uh, most representative model for, for the rock. Uh, if you're talking about the, the failure model, uh, then I just explained that typically in, in geomechanics, we, we prefer to go for nonlinear failure, uh, basically envelopes rather than the, the linear one. I hope I answered the question, but yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. We really ap appreciate your valuable time and your efforts. And thank you all. The lecture will be uploaded to Pi Petro YouTube channel and don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. Best of luck and thank you again. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Ahmed.